welcome back okay so promises what are they if you haven't heard about them we're going to talk about them today and we're going to talk about this dollar sign q and service that angular provides so before we get into it though we're going to of course want to see the problems with the current way we might do things without promises so what is the problem that promises are trying to solve and of course we're going to definitely look at how you describe them um, you create them and use them and of course we're going to describe them so let's jump right in and get started. This is going to be a long one, but I'm going to go through it slowly. And I'm going to try and show you examples and illustrate for you the problem and the solution. So come on and follow me into the forest of promises. I said so this section is going to be on promises and, and using the Angular dollar sign Q service. But before we can see the Angular Data SMQ service, or even talk about what a promise is, we need to kind of understand what the problem is. No. And before I do that, I just want to set the context and why we're doing it. So we're talking about ng full stack, and it generates some code for us using its sub-generators. And some of the code it generates look like this. And you can see here is the Data SMQ service from Angular, and it's being used, and there's this call to reject. And basically what it's doing is it's using this idea of a promise. And so one reason for us learning promises is so that we can understand how it's being used and don't get distracted by the use of promises in the code that is generated. So that's the reason why we're gonna look at promises. Now, promises is sort of new to JavaScript, not relatively new in like six months or anything like that. It's been around for probably a couple of years. And to be honest with you, uh, when it first came out, a couple of years ago, I was reluctant to use them heavily. And that's one reason was really because they were fairly new, there are a couple of competing ways of doing them, and there were a few libraries and so on. But anyway, I used them a little bit, and recently I've been using them more and more. So about a few months ago, earlier this year, you gotta say, I started using promises more heavily. And so now I'm really, really sure that it, promises are the way to go. So let me illustrate the problem for you with old promises, and then we'll get into how to use them, okay? So what I've done is I've copied our last example that we used during this chapter six and changed that directory, started the code editor, and there it is. So this is exactly the code that we had from, um, from the previous section. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start up um, a web server here, but instead of using Python, I'm gonna use this one called Reload. You can install reload with npm install, and you can spell it out or abbreviate it, minus g, and just type reload, all right? So I've already installed it, so I'm just gonna type reload. And the nice thing reload gives me is it automatically refreshes my browser when it notices any of the files in the directory cha has changed. So I really don't need to refresh my browser. So I only need to like load it up one time, and then that's it. So I don't need these two controllers, this diff tag, so I'm gonna take that out. Um, I'm gonna put here ng controller. Uh, huh. I think I took out a little too much. So let's try that again. Bam. I'll put ng controller, and then I'm gonna say main controller is what I wanna use. And I know it's how I'm going to I'm go over here to the app code, and I don't need all of these, so. I'm gonna take out all of this, and then I'm gonna change this one controller to main controller. I don't need this because I don't have any of these anymore anyway. And so I'm just gonna start inject downside scope. And let's do downside scope that result, make sure everything is out working. And now let's go back here and print it out. So let's just say we have h2 tag result that and then result and let me close my tag all right so reformat a little bit go back here and let's see i should be seeing my result and there it is so notice my thing updated i didn't have to refresh all right so that's fine so that's working so imagine that the way i'm getting this result was by calling a some operation, maybe an add function that takes two parameters, three and seven, to perform the addition. And here's my function, add, a, b, and var 
R is equals to A plus B, and then I return R, right? This doesn't change anything significant about my code other than I call a function, and I still get the same results. Um, you can look here, you can see it's refresh, and okay, still the same result. Um, now, I can change this if you like to like maybe one, and you can see it, can, it will change to eight eventually. All right, so that's working fine. What we want to talk about now is when we make a call to the back end, like when we make HTTP call as we were doing when we were playing with REST, and we saw that, oh, you can call dollar sign HTTP, and you could do a get, and you pass some parameter, but then we know that wouldn't come back right away, so then we'll call like a then function or, you know, success, and then pass a function callback. So if it's successful, our function gets called. And so what we were using there was actually promises. Um, because instead of value being returned to it, what was returned is a promise of the future value, whether it's resolved or rejected. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's try and continue going this way and say, what if there was a delay? Because the problem with calling backend services, you never know how long it's going to take. And instead of your code being called and trapped there, what tends to happen is you pass a callback to say, when the value is ready, give it to me. So a typical way this would happen would be something like this. Uh, would be something like this. It's call my function add, pass in a callback, which I'll make here an anonymous function, which will take the result. And when that's ready, when my function is, the animus function is called with the result, I'll assign it to my scope. And of course, here I have to take a callback. So let's say ready is my, the function I want, or maybe success, and this call is successful, then call my function. And so it would be, instead of doing a return, it would do success, let's just call it success. R. R. All right. And we should see that, oh, this doesn't change uh, the code significantly. Let me reformat. And so I still get the same results. And let's put it back to three, and we'll see this is going to eventually update to show 10. All right. So we understand this that we can do a callback, a function, uh, a pass a function as a callback. And you can imagine that between here, when I call the function, it takes, takes some time to get results, okay? So from the time I call the function, uh, it takes some time, and then it eventually calls my success function, and the result is ready. And we can imagine that. That's not the important thing. Now, imagine that typically when we make a call to the back end, for example, to log in a user, you might then want to say, on result of the user logging in successfully, I want to do something else. So um, maybe uh, we're going to pretend that is the case here by saying that I want to do another operation. So I want to use result that I got from the first call on this being successful to add it to and do another addition, another function call. Okay. And now if I, if I do this, now you can see that my first call function call here is 3 plus 7, which should give me 10 once this function, once this is resolved, I get 10 here. And then only after this fun anonymous function is called and resolved, then I want to do take that result of 10, result of 10, and add 5 to it. And then, of course, I have to pass another function, um, anonymous function here, which is going to, again, give me another result of 15. And then I assign that to my scope, and there you see the end result. And I can keep going like this, and I could say, well, after I've done that, maybe what I really want to do is produce something else. You know, maybe I want to say, um, you know, make another call um, and let it be 20. And then, of course, I have to nest this again. And now you can see how this is starting to look now. It's not going in. So... If the first one is successful, then do the second one. If this is successful, then do this. And of course, we're not handling errors. So for, for example, an error for us might be if the addition of these two numbers results in a negative number, that's considered an error. And if we need to handle that, so for example, if I pass minus 20 here, 
Um, and so if I wanted to take care of that, I'd have to pass a second parameter here for error. So the error for callback, and then now I can do something like um, if zero is greater than the result r, then I want to call the error function with maybe negative value, negative result or something like that, and then else I want to do, you know, call the success, right? Does that make sense? And so now I can, I'm in a position, oops, else, uh, now I'm in a position to handle errors. And of course, you can see here, I didn't get any result um, back because I tried calling this error function that I never passed in. So in order for me to get a result, I have to go here now and say function error message, for example, right? And then console that, you know, well, we can do console.log or we can just do put it on the scope since we have the scope already. Error. And then as error message. Right? And now I'll need to modify this and I'll put this in a paragraph and I'll say error message. If there's one, then error. Okay. Okay, and so there you see, and now my um, error message is showing up. But this is only handling an error if this third call have an error. What if this was a negative, um, a negative number, right? Um, you know, I wouldn't get the error from here. I'll get the error till at the end, right? Um, notice again, I have this problem because my error function is trying to call on this invocation, but that error parameter was not defined. So in order for this to work, I'll have to copy this and stick it here. And of course, I have to do the same thing here. And now, as you can see, I have this nesting of stuff that's getting pretty confusing just to be able to handle errors. And so that is pretty bad. So there, that's the problem when we do call back this way. When you have to pass a call back for and then the error, even when we we're doing just the success function, notice how it wasn't looking that nice. It looks still looks something like this. If we take this out, this still look pretty bad, right? And not easily um, to maintain. And you could, and you see, this is just three level of nested. What if you have a number of events that um, number of calls that depend on each other? Like if this is successful, then do this other thing or do this other thing. It becomes a little bit harder to handle. So that's so. This is the problem, and promises is the way that they solve it. And the way they solve promises is to imagine this. Now let's go back just a little bit. You remember when we had this, when we said, "Oh, we can return R." So let's take this out from here. We can return R, but we know that oh, um, this takes a long time. So you don't want to wait until this up call a function. I have to wait until the result is ready. We still want to be able to handle things asynchronously, which means we make a call, go off and do something else, and when the result is ready, then we're told about it and we handle it. So in that case, the way we can do it is by doing this. We can say that we want to return a promise instead, and on that promise, we're going to invoke the den function. The den function is where we're going to pass our callback. So Let's do, let's do that. Um, let me take out all these. I'll get back to all we nest later on. So assuming I did this correctly, it looks like this. So imagine that the add function here, instead of returning the result, it returns some object and that object added a then function. And you call the then function, meaning that if it's successful, I want you to then invoke my thing. So the result is the same, it's just the semantics is different, and you're gonna see why that makes things a little bit better. So now, how do we create a promise then? Because remember, this can be R, this has to be some object that's a promise, right? And this promise, um, when you return a promise, well, 
it must have this then function and be able to provide the result that you want. And so that's where the dollar sign Q service comes in that Angular provides you. It allows you to create promises very easily. And the way you create a promise is you say, I want to create a default object. So let's do um, var d is equals to dollar sign Q dot D E F E R default. So I call the default method on this Q service. I create for it creates a default object for me. Now, what I can do is return a promise from that default object by saying d that promise. So the default object has also a promise on it, and a promise object, and you, you can simply return that. Now, how do you then provide this value r to the user? Well, let's pretend that, like I said, this takes some time. So I'm going to use the set timeout um, function from JavaScript in which I'll pass it a function that will be called a bit later. So it's a timeout. It says basically I'm calling timeout with a function and I want you to call my function after 500 milliseconds. So let's say I made this one second by putting a thousand milliseconds here. It essentially says from the time I call it, wait 1000 milliseconds and then call this function I'm giving you. And the same thing if this is 500. Just wait 500 milliseconds after I call you to call my function. But of course, watch what would have happened by then. I'm coming add. I create a default object. I create calculate my results. Well, I don't even have to calculate my results. Since we're pretending that uh, this happened and it takes a long time, this is going to happen inside my callback function here, um, the calculation of this result. And then... Of course, you return this promise, but this is returned before the user gets back the re this promise, this D that promise, they get back that before this function in here even gets called. Because only 500 milliseconds later, this function is going to get called. So, how is this value, how does this promise then provide the result here of R? Well, after 500 milliseconds and when this function is run, do the calculation and then on the default object that resolve uh, resolve resolve the the promise to be to this value r so now after 500 uh, milliseconds this promise is going to be resolved and the then function is going to be called the nice thing about a promise also is that there is no issue about a race condition let's say for example um, this resolve get called um, before the user actually called then on this. So let's say the user actually did something like this. They did var p equals to at function, and then they did a lot of stuff here, you know, blah, 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 um, stuff that really took a long, long time. More than um, 500 milliseconds. And then after they did all of that, then they go, oh, let me go see if my promise is resolved. Then they can go and still call P that then. And it doesn't matter that if it was resolved in the past, when they call it, they'll see that it's resolved. All right? So you really get away from any race condition um, with this promise and when you can call it. So don't worry about if you, if you have to call it right away or you're going to miss the time that it when it get resolved. Don't worry about it. But that all that is taken care of for you by promises. All right, so now we see that all, it is still working well. Well, this default, um, so the resolve, when you call D that resolve, it returns, you know, it resolve with whatever results you want. The other thing you can do is still do um, errors. So, for example, let's say we wanted to do what we were talking about before, where if the result is negative, right? Um, you can show error message. So I'll do that. I'll say if zero is greater than R, it means R is negative. So what I want to do is say D that reject negative value or whatever, negative number or value. Let's do value. All right. And then else Resolve it. So let's reformat this. 
So now, later on, so I return a promise, a promise to be resolved later or be rejected later. So you just call then, meaning that if it's successful, get that 10. But if it's not successful, like if I put minus here, then it's going to be rejected and they're not going to get 10. Notice how they didn't get 10. But how do they get the second parameter? Well, they could pass that here, uh, do a function, um, you know, error message, I guess. And, you know, dollar sign scope that error equals the error message. And that would give them, um, give you the same thing that what we had before. Notice how it works also. But, the, but what about nesting or chaining calls? So we don't have to nest there. We can just simply chain. So after this, I can say, copy this. And I can literally paste it at the end here. And I can say, I want to make another call to add. So when the first one resolves, I want to call return add of the result of my first result plus, I don't know, five or something. So let's make this back a negative um, plus. So what I'm doing here now, and let's take out this error call for now. I'm not gonna cheat, I'm gonna get back to the error call in a bit. Just wanna, sh let's focus on sim the chain in for now. And so notice how add returns a promise. I use the then function to, because it's a successful, I want to do another head, which was like our nesting, and I return the result of that head. So since this returned a promise, and I'm returning it from inside of then, this then function then returns that promise, the second promise from add, and now I can call then again on it, and I could keep going, right? So this, um, I can call yet again another uh, thing. And the, the beauty is that you don't even have to return just promises. You can return anything, and we'll get to that in a minute. Notice how this still works. So I just said it, oh, you can return anything from a then function, any value, and it becomes a promise. So for example, let's imagine that what I really want to do after I do add three plus seven, and then I, the result of that plus five, maybe here, what I want to do is result, return, return the result of creating an array of a certain size, which is the size being result, and then join in, so join in that array, which let's say stars. So what I've done is I've created an array, and then that new array is gonna be 10 elements. I join those elements, which are hem is empty by the way, and I join them with stars. Now if the, there were actually things in that L array, if I join them, these stars would be in between. So let's say I, I decide to join my elements like that you would see come out in between those elements, but um, I actually don't have anything, so um, I'm just put star. And so now I return that. Notice when I return that value, which is just a string, that gets turned into a promise upon which then is called again. And then that result of the string of stars is now assigned here. So then function is very powerful. Let me just say that again. You can return a promise in a then function which you can chain to, or you can just return another string, any value you return, and that also becomes a promise, if it's not a promise, because here I'm just returning a string, and then um, you can chain to it. So just to prove that you can return anything, if this array doesn't prove it, I'm gonna return hello world. And I'm just gonna do that, and you can see, returning the string hello world, turn it into a promise from this then function, which I can now chain um, and notice I can call then on it here, all right? So hopefully you're convinced now that I can chain promises and returning a value from a then function and a promises just creates another promise. That is key, keep that in mind. Returning a value from a then function allows you to create another promise upon which you can chain. So this looks better than what we had before when we were nesting things. And just to kind of drive it home, I'm gonna make this a call to another add function, add function, result, um, let's say 20, okay, which is what I did before. And you can see this looks, it is not nesting. Even if I call more add function, it just goes on and on. 
But what about that error? What about if I actually add a, an error here of this is negative? Well, before you saw me call, put the error function as a second parameter. If we did that here, you can do that, but it's going to be looking a little bit messy, right? Still not as indented crazy as the first one, but it's still going to look messy. What I can do is I can do a catch function call here, which catches the error, right? Error message. MESG. And now I can do scope that error is equals to error message. And the advantage of this is notice how nice and clean this is. Um, why is this uh, misbehaving? So that is saying catch function. This is not spelled correctly. Okay. Catch function error message is that anywhere in this chain, so whichever one of these, if this first promise, if when I call this with a minus seven, this is going to return an error that gets passed through all the way to the end. You can see negative value. And if this returns a minus um, the, the error, it gets passed through to the end. So anywhere along the chain, it's going to refresh. Same thing. The result is, um, oh, so I cheated because uh, now let's see a proper result first and then see the, the negative being passed through. So there's 35. I'm going to make this negative. And that first one should return a negative result. And there we go, right? And you can see the others did not get called because 3 plus minus 7 is minus 4. And so the then here did not get called. This then did not get called. This then did not get called. It came all the way to this catch because this first one generated a, an error. And then if I go here and I do um, minus 15, we're going to get 10. There's a success call. It's going to call 10 plus minus 15. We'll give you minus 5. The error is going to be called, so this would not get called. This will not get called, and this got called. And there you see it. And I can go back and do the same thing here with a minus 20. So you got 15 plus minus 20, which again gives you a minus 5. So this success function wouldn't get called, but this. So now you can see we can put our error handle in one place. Now what if there was something that we wanted to do? So notice that depending on the error situation, I might be skipping over some of these calls. So one of the things I might want to do is to um, you know, do a summation of how long these function call takes. So let me give you an example. So the beginning before I call this, I might say var now is equals to date that now. Okay? So it gets the current time just before I call um, my add function. Uh, ma'am. Right? And then when at the when I get the result, I want to see how long it takes. So I want to do dollar scope that elapse time is equals to date that now minus the now that I've created at the beginning, right? And so this should give me the time it takes to calculate my res result from the very first call to the last call here. And so let's go back here and let's do, um, you know, another um, p tag, whatever, and I'm going to say elapsed time is time okay and just for the kicks of it I'm gonna do that and I'm a format okay all right so now we should be able to see the elapsed time is um, just a minute sec minute and a half and that makes sense because I have three ad calls and each call is about five and a half a second so it makes sense that three of them should be about a minute and a half so that adds up nicely well what about the case when I have an error somewhere like minus 15 here um, because this function is not going to get called this is a success function it's going to go call the error only I don't get my calculation of elapsed time so what I want to do is move this out but I can't put it here because I don't always get an error so now when I have an error well yeah that's going to work I'm going to see a time pop up here now because well 
this took 30 seconds, this 30, half a minute, this took half a minute, even though it had an error, it still took half a minute because I still had to wait half a minute before this function was even called to see that there was an error. So it makes sense that this is about a minute. It would be nice that regardless of if there was success or error, something was called, and that's where the finally comes in. So if you use the finally function, now I can put my time calculation in finally, and now regardless of which one of these success function or error function gets called, this finally function will always get called. And so now you see that yes, it still called the first two and hence that's why it took a minute. And then if I put it here, I should see it take about just over half a minute or about half a minute or 500 milliseconds. And there you see it. And then if I take that out and put it here, I should still see the one and a half minute because it still had to call the first one, second one, the third one before it realizes an error. But notice my finally function gets called regardless and I don't have to worry about which one to put them in. So let's recap really quickly. Um, passing the function directly to the, uh, a, fun a callback directly to the function during the operation um, is not as clean as having that function return, the function during the operation, return a promise. Creating a promise is very easy in Angular. Use a dollar sign Q to create a default object and then ask the default object for the promise that you return immediately. You can then later fulfill, which is resolve, that promise or reject it. And when you reject it, you can provide a value, whatever value makes sense. It doesn't have to be a string. But, you know, a string allows you to be descriptive about why you're rejecting it and so on. So you can imagine if there's a RESTful call you're making, and you fetch the array, you resolve it with the array, but when you reject it, you provide um, maybe a message of why it failed, whether it was authentication failure, or server not available, or whatever the case might be. Um, and then, in terms of using that promise, once you get back the promise, you can simply chain the then call on it, um, which are the success call, and just need to use one catch if there's an error in the chain. And then, of course, you have the option of using finally um, if there's something you need to always run in that chain. So I hope that illustrates promises and how to use them in Angular using the Dallas MQ service. Promises are going to be built into ES6. Remember I said ES6 is the newer JavaScript that's coming out and it's in some browsers already. Um, and we don't need to really worry about that right now. There's no point in going over that until I see that though it looks like we're going to need it. If we're using something that needs it, then we'll do it. So we cover things as we need to and don't try to burden ourselves knowing too much stuff up front until we're ready to use it. All right. So it looks now like we've covered the, some of the, the two things that prevent us from or would have made it more difficult in us understanding some of the generated code from NG full stack. Now we have covered promises and in a previous video really clarified function versus factories um, in Angular. Now we're going to go back in the next video and continue using the subgenerator. After we get you the subgenerator, we're going to go to the next chapter 10 where we're going to actually generate again, uh, generate our to-do application, write it out, and we are essentially done. All right. Take care. Thank you for your time. I hope you found this um, you know, educational, inspiring even. Um, I hope you like it. Um, spread the word. Definitely spread the word. I'd really love to see more people coming to see what I'm doing. Um, even if they tell me I thought there's something that um, I can improve on, I'd like to hear that. And of course, I'd like to see this grow. It's really my passion to teach people. And I love programming. I program a number of languages and technologies. And I really would like to find the time to do more of this and do it more often. But for now, this is what it is. Um, see you in the next video. Take care, thanks for joining me again. Bye.